The BFI National Archive recently undertook the preservation of three petabytes, that's three million gigabytes, of legacy DPX film scans held within its collection on LTO data tape and generated during the Britain on Film project. If you would like to take a look at these films, please visit the BFI's Britain on Film map, which you can see here. This preservation project identified one primary focus, digital preservation using a lossless, open, standards-based format that is increasingly adopted by public archives around the world. Raw Cooked was chosen to encode the DPX sequences to FFV1 video codec in a Matroska container. This codec offers amazing features for audiovisual preservation, including large file size reductions, frame slices that improve multi-threading playback performance, and sliced CRCs, or cyclic redundancy checks, that make it possible for a decoder to detect bitstream errors. Both FFV1 and Matroska are proven, open and standards-based solutions, created by a talented global audiovisual archiving community. For those unfamiliar with film, a digitised DPX image sequence has one high-resolution image for every film's frame, so a 90-minute film at 24 frames per second has almost 130,000 DPX files within it. This can create a sequence as large as 10 terabytes in size, if it's being scanned for 4K distribution. Raw Cooked's lossless compression to FFV1 can reduce that overall file size by between one and two thirds on average, which not only saves money on storage solutions, but reduces demand on networks. This is most noticeable when moving files to long-term data tape storage, taking less time to write to and retrieve from LTO tape libraries. To show you how it works, Royal Cook's latest software version, 21.09, takes an image sequence folder and easily encodes them into a single video stream using the all command, leaving you with a video that can be played in many applications. The all command combines several other important commands, ensuring the highest standard of image sequence encoding. It can be used to transcode an image sequence to FFV1 Matroska, but it can also be used to return an FFV1 Matroska back to an image sequence, a bit-by-bit -bit perfect copy of the original. So the all command includes the following subcommands. Info provides basic information about the compressed Matroska file, like the presence of hashes in the raw data. Conch performs a conformance check of the supplied format, whether that be DPX, TIFF, WAV, FLAC or FFV1 Matroska. Coherency checks the coherency of an image sequence package. For example, it checks if a WAV file is the same duration as the DPX sequence, checks for gaps in file image number sequencing, and if a file already exists where the new Matroska will be situated. Hash. This is a very important action. It computes whole file CRC hashes for all audiovisual files in your image sequence folder. These hashes are then stored in the raw cooked reversibility data file and embedded in the Matroska container, where they are accessed during reversibility checks. Check. This action is responsible for checking the generated FFV1 Matroska file is fully reversible by decoding the Matroska and comparing that against the DPX hashes stored in the metadata during encoding. Check padding. This action is identical to the check action with the addition that it will inspect and compare the padded bit data stored during encoding into the raw cooked reversibility data, only to be used when non-zero padding bits are identified as it increases the time taken to analyse the reversibility of the Matroska. Encode or decode. Encode and decode are automatically selected based on the file type passed to raw cooked software. If an image sequence is passed, or the first image file in a sequence, it will select ENCODE. If an FFV1 Matroska is passed in the command line, then DECODE is selected. So let's take a quick look at the encoding process using the dash dash all command and the logs that raw cooked and FFmpeg generates. It can take minutes or hours to encode an image sequence, depending upon the configuration of the system running the command and the scan size and frame length of a film reel. The process begins by assessing each image file counting through to 100% completion. At this point, the FFmpeg command is generated by raw cooked and the encoding begins. The next output we see are FFmpeg encoding outputs, 
When this is completed, Raw Cooked runs its reversibility checks and these again analyse the file counting up to 100% completion. When the encoding is completed, you will receive a message, reversibility was checked, no issues detected. If the software encountered a problem with the image sequence, such as trying to encode a format that you do not have a license for, or a malformed image file, then you will either receive the message before the FFmpeg encoding begins, or at the end of the reversibility checks. These will always have error or warning declaratives, and provide an explanation about the issue to help you resolve it. If the sequence includes an audio file, then this is also compressed to FLAC or PCM and streamed within the media file. Any other sidecar files are stored in the Matroska container as attachments, along with the raw cooked reversibility data. This reversibility data allows for the FFE1 Matroska to be unpacked again using the all command, returning the DPX sequence back to its original form. We currently have a raw cooked license to encode RGB 10 bit and 16 bit and Luma Y 16 bit, which is a single Luma plane without any color information. And we don't encode any audio files as they are ingested to DPI as their own assets. So raw cooked is created by Media Area, a group of developer archivists led by Jerome Martinez, who is also speaking here tomorrow. This group produce audio visual tools with preservation interests at their heart. From Media Area's toolset, we also use Media Info to view and interrogate file metadata and Media Conch for file conformancy checking. Media Info allows you to look at the file metadata in various ways, from basic stream data to a detailed media trace output, which provides the binary architecture of a file. Media Conch lets you create a conformance policy as an XML file, customising the metadata you want to check in each file. If the metadata is missing or not the correct value, then the validation will fail. As we have thousands of sequences to process and project deadlines, it was essential that bash scripts were written to automate the workflows around the clock. Our workflow started in 2019 with two bash scripts written by Head of Data and Digital Preservation, Stephen McConaughey. Over the last two years, these scripts have evolved into five bash scripts and two Python scripts. These essentially manage the whole process of DPX digitization and DPI ingest from start through to deletion of the DPX sequence. They have recently been expanded to include 4K processing for our in-house scanning workflows. In the spirit of the open source software and the community that this workflow is inspired by, we feel it's really important to share the scripts in full via our data and digital preservation GitHub pages, which you can see here. These scripts are all scheduled and run at different times during the day. We use Linux Ubuntu workstations and the scripts are triggered by placing the launch commands in a cron tab, which is a scheduling tool that has very specific date and time triggers allocated to each script, allowing for exact script run times. So let's go through the scripts and I'll give you a quick overview of what each one does. We'll follow the order that the scripts act against each DPX sequences. Virtually every aspect of the workflow you're about to see is completely free to build and run using a Linux workstation with media area tools. dpxassessment.sh This is a bash shell script indicated by the .sh extension. It runs once every eight hours. This script looks into the folder called dpx to assess where all new image sequences are first placed. For each DPX sequence, the script creates metadata text files to be stored as attachments, then extracts the DPX metadata of the first file and checks to see if it's suitable for raw cooked encoding. For this, we use Media Conch, which looks in the DPX metadata for raw cooked minimum specifications, license specifications, and for DPX width and color information. This width and color information is used to separate the sequences into one of a few different categories. 2K RGB, Luma Y, 4K, or sequences for tar wrapping because they failed the media conch policy. Each category, complete with the DPX sequence path and total file size, are passed one sequence at a time to the next script, DPX splitting script.py. This is a very new script, recently written in Python 3, denoted by the .py extension. 
because of the very large size of 4K files and the maximum DPI ingest size of one terabyte. We have to provide a secure method for splitting evenly one DPX sequence across multiple folders. The previous script groups DPX into categories because each category has a slightly different encoding reduction percentage. The highest, RGB2K, after encoding to FFV1, can be as much as two thirds smaller than its original DPX sequence. Luma Y and 4K are both quite new to our workflows and have more variable results, anywhere between 5% and 30% reductions. Tar wrapping has no reduction. These reductions dictate how many folder splits we make per sequence. Here's a table of how we currently divide our folders. Raw cooked RGB sequences get split into folders 1.3 terabytes in total size. Luma Y, 4K are currently set at 1 terabyte along with the tar wrapping. Once we have more data about encoding Luma Y and 4K, these may get adjusted, but for now we'd rather be safe than sorry in case they are around about 5% reduction. Because we have multiple real folders, for example 01 of 05 through to 05 of 05, we need to have a rigid way to make sure that splits are safe at any point in this sequence range. For example, if 01 of 05 needs four splits and three new folders to hold these new DPX file groups, then the new part hole numbers for this sequence become 01 of 08 to 08 of 08. Three new folders become two of eight, three of eight, and four of eight. Then all the remaining items must update from 2 of 5 to 5 of 8, 5 of 5 to 8 of 8, etc. To manage this, a CSV file was created, where the left column's original number and right column new number maintain a strict record of all these changes. Another necessary precaution is that no sequence from a multi-real set can pass through to encoding until all parts are present and have been size assessed and renumbered. Finally, we need to map clearly these divisions for our film operations teams who need to relocate these reels in the future. We have three steps to give them this information. A text file that is embedded inside each split Matroska folder. A human readable DPX splitting log where they can search for the original DPX sequence number and discover its new divisions. And the same data written into our National Archive database in the item record for the DPX sequence dpx part whole move dot pi. This Python script only looks at folders in the part whole split folder. First it checks if each dpx sequence is in the left original number column of the renumbering CFV. If so, it updates its number to the new part whole. It then looks for first parts in sequences, for example 01 of 02. It creates a full range for the multi-reel as a list through from its parts, then it looks for every single reel in the part whole split folder. Only when all parts are found are they all moved together onto their encoding paths. If any one reel is absent, then a note is added to the log and the script skips this group of reels. TPX raw cooked.sh. This script is set to run every 15 minutes, but is blocked by flock until the current active script completes working through its list. This ensures that the script is running as often as is possible without accidentally overlapping and processing two sequences at the same time. The script is looking in the raw cooked encoding path, waiting for the completed sequences from the part whole split folder to be moved in for processing. It makes two encoding passes with two slightly different commands. As you can see, these are identical except one has an output version 2 option and the other has the minus s and the number. Let's talk through what the flags mean. Dash y answers yes to any inquiries that FFmpeg should make, such as shall I overwrite this file. Dash dash all is the command we discussed earlier. Dash dash no accept gaps. This flag is used to stop gaps passing through without failing the encoding. Dash s 5281680 sets the maximum attachment size limit up to 5 megabytes. The second script is only run when the first script fails because the reversibility data is becoming too large. This problem happens only with certain scanners, 
when usual zero padding bits in each DPX instead have secret data stored in them. Rulecooked stores this secret data into the reversibility file to ensure perfect reversibility, but this makes the reversibility file too large for FFmpeg to add as an attachment during encoding. Anything over one gigabyte is too big. Version 21.09 of Rulecooked released this flag to handle these oversized reversibility files, attaching them after the encoding is finished. The output version 2 flag is used to make this happen. No maximum attachment flag is required as all the attachments are appended after the encoding. These commands are launched again using software called GNU Parallel, a brilliant OS tool for Linux Mac that allows multiple script jobs to be run concurrently. We set the jobs at five parallel encodings. And the final piece of the command, the at and the two right arrows, tells the logs to be output to a specific file. These encoding logs are critical to the operation of the next script. DPX post raw cook .sh. This script assesses the FFV1 Matroska file and the logs to ensure the preservation process has been successful. First, the FFV1 Matroska is compared to a media conch policy which checks for bit rates above 300 megabits a second, FFV1 slices at 16 or above, the FFV1 codec has error detection, is lossless and has intraframe settings. A file that passes this media conch policy may not necessarily pass through to our long-term preservation because the second stage assesses the log generated by raw cooked and if error messages reveal a reversibility fault, then the FFV1 files have failed, deleted, and the sequence will be requeued for encoding. If it finds a specific error message about oversized reversibility data, it appends the path of the DPX sequence to the retry list so that the output version 2 command is used in DPX raw cook. If it finds more generic warning or error messages, then it retries again without this flag and adds the folder name to an errors list. If all is well and the file has been processed fine with no errors, then the FFV1 Matroska is moved to our automated DPI ingest folder and the DPX sequence is moved to a DPX completed folder where the final script processes them. dpxcleanup.sh The final script is run just once a day outside of work hours. It checks DPX completed folder for evidence that each sequence's FFV1 Matroska has been successfully ingested into DPI by running a comparison of the file name against ingest logs. If a deleted confirmation is found in the logs, then the original DPX sequence is moved from DPX completed folder to the deletions folder. In here, the script deletes the folder, which can take quite a long time, hence the movement before the deletion. So that's the Swift overview. We're currently a fifth of the way through this project and have over 2,500 video files ingested into the digital preservation infrastructure. This includes Socialism on Film from the Educational and Television Films collection, shown here. Many of these items have colourful optical audio tracks, making them extra beautiful to look at, while revealing some of the mechanics of the film technology for the first time, usually lost in post-production. We predict that using Raw Cooked for this Heritage 2022 project will save us a total of 1600 terabytes of storage space. By reducing the content storage footprint by more than half, we ease the burden of future tape migrations. We are already enjoying reduced network impact. Our projected savings will be in the region of £45,000 for this project alone. In addition, we recently undertook a review of our film scan specifications using these findings to better inform our suppliers of safe parameters for successful raw cooked encoding. These open source tools are not expensive to implement, but open source shouldn't be thought of as free. Users of these tools need to work together to establish financial support for their long-term sustainability. To that end, the BFI has sponsored several features and is currently investigating feature developments necessary to our collections, including the potential for Raw Cooked to encode DCDM folders. Raw Cooked, FFV1 and Matroska offer unique and exciting solutions for long-term audiovisual preservation, providing much-needed format stability and financial savings. 
I'd like to thank Jerome Martinez for his patience and support during the development of these scripts and thank the wider community whose blogs, technical guides and cheat sheets continue to aid us in the creation and maintenance of our workflows.